Welcome to Grandma Magic, a podcast from the Grandmother Collective. We are a nonprofit organization that supports and advocates for a world where a grandmother's power is seen, cultivated, and activated for positive change. The Grandma Magic podcast is an opportunity to learn more about the unique roles that grandmothers, aunties, and other older women around the world can play in advancing positive social development by talking to and learning from grandmother changemakers. We hope this series inspires you, brings you joy, and helps you recognize the enduring magic and wisdom that comes from grandmothers everywhere. I'm Lindsay Farrell, and I'm your host. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Philomena Anyanwu, a gerontologist and social worker with over 14 years of experience helping rural communities reimagine the lives of older persons in Nigeria. Philomena has been at the forefront of designing new standards of care, developing innovative care models, and engaging local communities to deploy services that improve the functional and social abilities of older persons, enabling them to live dignified, independent lives and contribute to their communities and society. Recognizing that independent efforts alone aren't enough to drive systemic change, Philomena founded the Association of Care Service Providers to Older Persons in Nigeria, a coalition of 60 organizations and currently serves as its national president. Additionally, she founded L Aged Care, an NGO dedicated to delivering an alternative community care model to support older persons in rural Nigeria. Philomena is also a social entrepreneur and an Ashoka Fellow. So today we'll explore Philomena's inspiring journey and discover the powerful ways she is influencing change in the lives of older persons across Nigeria. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. I'm so delighted that you've also joined the Grandmother Collective as a member organization. So this is an opportunity for our listeners to also hear from one of our members. So Philomena, what I've been asking everybody this season, because we really understand how important and significant women and older women, particularly the role that they play in making sure that our culture continues and that it's preserved. And so I've been asking everybody, what is a tradition that they are making sure that they pass down to the generations after them? So what is one of those for you? One of the traditions I will want to pass on to the next generation is promotion of healthy aging and self-care practice. It's called Omugwa. Omugwa. Yeah. Omugwa, the older women in southeastern Nigeria, there's a traditional ritual they undertake when their children are delivered of newborn babies. So they go on what we call Omugwa. Omugwa is a ritual. These grandmothers reside, they go take residence with their daughters who have just delivered a baby for a period of up to six months to care for both mother and baby, helping the newly delivered mother or woman to adjust to life after childbirth. That is the practice we call Omogo. It is the Igbo term. Like I said, the people from southeastern Nigeria are called Igbos. So this Omogo is the Igbo term for traditional custom of postpartum care. So that's why I said promotion of healthy aging and self-care practice for the grandmothers that go on this ritual. So the Omogo ritual is their own way of handling postpartum care. It's an ancient Igbo tradition. It's very important to these um, Igbo people. It is their cultural response to the burden of mothers who just had new babies because they have to wake up in the night, take care of these babies. They're crying. You have to change their nappies, clean them up. So for newly delivered mothers who have no experience, even those that have experience, go through a lot of stress. So their mothers take residence in their place to do help them go through this. And I was doing a research. I found out that before now, the presence of Mugwa reduces the stress and the anxiety that come with motherhood. Hence, it limits the risk of developing postpartum depression. No wonder these Igbo people, you know, long it's, it's an ancient tradition. They know it and that's, they've been practicing it. 
And it's also reported, research has it that uh, some of the psychosocial risk factors that give rise to postpartum depression is the lack of social support. So when these grandmothers go there to care for their daughters and their grandchild, they are providing support. It gives the new mother opportunity to raise, also learn from the grandmothers how to handle, how to care for these children. However, carrying out this Omugo cultural ritual can be challenging to the grandmother because usually it will cause a lot of stress, burnout. That is if the grandmother doesn't practice self-care. It's going to cause all that. I have seen cases. I have been involved in handling cases where grandmothers go on Omugo and they die. Some come back what? with health what? complications. Why is that happening? I'm going to tell you why. They go in there, they are happy, their daughters have just had a, a new baby, they have their grandmothers, they're going there with their full heart, they are doing all the care, they hardly sleep, they don't care, they want their daughter to be in good health, forgetting that they also have to care for themselves. I know a lady in Canada, I was there, a grandmother who came on a move to care for the daughter and the baby, and she was having a headache. Because she wouldn't sleep, the daughter just gave the baby to the mother, and then she would go relaxing with the husband. And then she started having a headache. And she told me, and I said, then, that was a long time ago, I never had an idea what that could mean. And I told her, why don't you take Tylenol? She did. He wouldn't go. And I said, tell your daughter. She said, no, 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 no. She doesn't have health insurance. And she doesn't want to be a burden to them. And she continued managing. I said, then give the child to the mother. No, 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 no. She has to recover from childbirth. And then she started throwing up. And finally, she slumped. And they had to call emergency, 911. That was when they found that she had mild stroke. She would have died. So it happens often. You go for Mugwo, you're so happy. You want your child, your daughter to have many more children. You don't want her to have a postpartum depression. You want her to be in good health. And then you're carrying all the load, forgetting you have to self-care. So that is why some of these things happen. One of the uh, community services that we deliver at our center is healthy aging and self-care intervention program. And then we also have part of our education program. We take our health promotion talks on health self-care and the healthy aging to churches. We go on radio because in the community, we hardly get TV. It's radio we are used to. We don't even have electricity here in the rural communities. And then we go to community social gatherings. Every August, the people in southeastern Nigeria and even south-south of Nigeria, they have what we call August meeting. If you Google it, you will see August meeting. Churches, women in churches gather and then they talk about how the church will grow, family issues, things that will empower women. And then we come in too. It's like an annual planning event. Yeah, like annual conference. A time to think about what you're going to do for the year ahead. Yeah, part of it. Also review past years. And then it's like a conference. People come to give talk. Like we also, from our center, we go out there to give them talk on healthy aging. And then we give them talk on healthy aging. They learn how healthy aging and self-care practice. So, and they, especially because you will find grandmothers there, mothers, not young girls. They must be mothers. So women, married women. So they form that August meeting group. So we talk to them what they expect, health, you know, essentially health promotion. And it's very important to us because, especially for those who have uh, chronic diseases, so we let them learn. You have chronic disease, and if you have to be able to, you want to age in place, you want to stay in your home and age, and be able to uh, get involved in this or uh, more ritual, you just have to learn to self-care and live healthy. So we teach them all that. So it's quite important to our work in LHK because it's a vital aspect of to age in place. 
and it's also helping grandmothers to carry out the Omogo traditional ritual to maintain healthy lives. So it is quite important to us, and that is one tradition I want to remain. I want people, even when I'm no longer here, pass it on. Because when we are aging, apart from these are non-communicable diseases, like I have back pain from my spine, and I'm going for mugo, which means I have to be sitting up, carrying baby and all that. I have to set care too. I have to listen to my body, know when I should say, no, I need to rest. That kind of thing. So we teach them all that. So you don't go over, label yourself, and then come back almost dead. So Lamina, you know, I was talking to somebody else in Kenya, and mm-hmm. she was telling me that she's very concerned that the labor that a lot of our older women take on, which is pretty invisible. So this amugwo, even though it's considered a tradition and a sort of an obligation or a responsibility for older women in the community, it sounds like what you're describing is that it's sort of taken for granted. And we don't recognize that our elder women also need care while they care so much for the communities in which they live. And I think that sounds like what you're trying to really raise visibility for. Exactly. I will tell you one thing. These are our grandmothers go on a mogul with smiles on their faces and they're coming back with big smiles on their faces. You don't even see the burden or they don't express, they don't show the label they have put in while in a mogul. I used to think as a mm. child that these women go there to enjoy. I didn't know that they go there to really do a lot of work. The labor understood. They work, yeah. I didn't know that because they come back with a few gifts for other women. Every woman is longing to go do it. Oh, my child should have baby fast. I want to go on a mobile. Oh, this other woman went. She came back so happy. I tell you. And... It is now that I realize, oh, this is not an easy job. The men are envying the women, thinking they go there to enjoy, you know. Do... Have a vacation. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they tell us here in the United States, a lot of people assume maternity leave, which, of, of course, we get very little. It's not paid, and we get very little maternity leave. But there is this assumption that it's a vacation, and the labor of women is just belittled everywhere you go. Yeah, that's it. That's the way it is for grandmothers. I will say it's a tradition. Nobody talks about the degree of or the severity of stress you go through. Nobody talks about it. So what I want to pass on, we should not minimize the effort, not minimize the labor, don't minimize the stress these grandmothers go through. Let's make sure they self care. They still have life to live if, you know, they still have future life to live. Their life should not end at going to a mugo because some of them go for a mugo, they never had cardiovascular disease before going. And then they come back with hypertension. But if they had been taught how to self care, you listen to your body, you know what to do. Yes, you're helping your daughter. You also have to help. You have a life to live as well. You have to help yourself. So that is the kind of tradition I want to pass on to the next generation. I think that's beautiful. I mean, all women need to learn self-care, but I'm sure it's especially acute in rural communities where the assumption is that women will just take on all the burdens and there's no way to even probably express that you're not doing well. There's not a way to do that. Okay. So Philomena, I'm very, very interested in how you ended up on this journey to working with older persons in Nigeria. How did you end up here? It actually started as a child. Growing up and in my early age, probably in primary school, I was really, really interested in helping the older people, especially the indigent and vulnerable older persons in my rural communities. The reason being that I was very close to my dad. My dad used to be a nurse. He's late now. Then doctors were very few. You hardly would see any doctor in the rural community. So you find nurses, 
very few nurses too. And nurses were seen like doctors. So my dad was a nurse and I was the first child of my dad. We were really, really close. So I used to help my dad. He would send me on errand. He would write something on the paper, say, go to this pharmacy, go buy this, give them this paper, they'll do this. So I was really close to him at that time. And then I started seeing people come in for treatment in the house. People come in and I started noticing as a child some differences. You, you find some people looking so poor, so haggard. Actually, in the rural community, when you see such haggard looking older persons, I'll call them indigent. People see them as, oh, they start pointing, accusing fingers at them. These are witches. They must have done something in their former world. That's why they are suffering. And if you look at this, some of them don't have children or they have children with disability. So they are suffering. So I became empathic. I yearned to help them. So my interest shifted as a child. I used to sneak out from her house. My mom will not know. There was this particular person I used to go help. You know, I would go help her do church. She would allow me because she had no help. So that drew me closer. And I was a Catholic. My parents were Catholic. So I used to see Reverend Sisters, the, the way they try to help people. And I said, why can't I be a, a Reverend Sister and then be able to give help to these people, legitimize it? So I said, I will go to the convent. As a child, I started nursing the idea. I told my parents, I want to go to convent and uh, be a nun. So I started visiting the Reverend Sisters in their convent. And then my parents stopped me because that is how they, they get these younger ones in. And then they stopped me from going to church and all that. And uh, well, they stopped me. They denied me the opportunity. I didn't lose my vision. It was there in my heart and mind. So I founded LHK in 2013. And I'm so happy I'm using it to achieve my mission of alleviating the sufferings experienced by these older persons. You will say, growing up, okay, what formed my opinion in 2013? Yes, as a child, yes, I had this empathy. I wanted to help, but it was still in my mind. I now realize I wanted to dig further down into why am I so interested in these older persons? I noticed in Nigeria, the traditional filial care support system is on the decline. Before now, it was like an obligation filial support. You have to help your parents because they helped you as a child. But now with modernization, and it was more of women staying back in the rural community to help care for these older persons. But with modernization, more women are now going to school. More girls now go to school because the young men used to go to the city to look for better life, I would call it. So these girls now that go to school, nobody wants to stay back in the rural community. They all are also looking for white collar jobs or something. So who now takes care of these people? That sister, that familial care support is on the decline. In Nigeria, 70% of older persons reside in the rural area. The reason being, even when they retire in the city, they still come back to the rural community, like 70%. The reason being that our cities are not designed for older persons. There are no walkways, no recreation facilities in the town for older persons. You retire, you can't drive smoothly on the road, a lot of hold up, and our driving system is terrible. So the older persons is, is like locked up in the house, isolated, lonely. So the best thing for them is to come back to the rural community, stay with people of their kind, and just stay there. But who cares for them? That has an issue. Which And from research, 6.3 million rural Nigerians, age 60 and above, are vulnerable. And if this number is expected to triple by 2050, you see why I'm coming in. Now, from WHO report that the two thirds of the population will be needing daily support, activities of daily living, due to health issues as they age. And now, without health care and social care services in the rural communities, 
the two third might even be more than two third because that's where I come in. You know, forty five percent are reporting lonely and isolated. Access to essential services, like I said, health and social care, access to them remains severely limited due to scarce resources. Nobody wants to come work in the rural community. Nobody, except you are just, you're really, really, you have that heart. Who wants to train the child? Instead of taking your child to a good school in the city, you now come to the rural community where you don't have good schools. Nobody wants to do that. And then they also have to do out-of-pocket payments for their services. There's poverty. The poverty rate here is quite high. So looking at this, there's a need to do something. Otherwise, we will be losing these older persons. So I had to step in. That's how LHK came in. We, our aim is to improve the system of care for these people and that will enable them to achieve optimum levels of physical social, psychological, and spiritual health, so that they will be wholesome. So that's what we do. Because I live here in the rural area. I'm a Canadian. I could have just stayed out there. But I decided to stay. Most of the time I'm here, except when I go to Canada a few times you know, in the year. I said, why did I choose to go this long-haul pathway to mainstream aging? Why? I strongly believe in our motto that Older persons in our society still have hopes. They are human. They have hopes. They have dreams. They want to attain their potential. They are economically productive. They help to reduce the stress that brings about postpartum depression. And that is an economic advantage. They deserve good quality of life. They shouldn't be left there like sentenced to isolation loneliness. No, they deserve good quality of life. I am aging. I'm a grandmother. I'm in my 60s. I'm also residing in rural community. I want to age in, in the rural community. If I don't establish a working and functional legal system at this time that I'm still strong, something that will allow these older persons to improve their functional and social abilities, something that will empower them to live dignified life because they all want to live. Nobody wants to be discriminated against. Nobody wants to be abused. Nobody wants to be segregated. For them to live dignified, independent life and be able to contribute to their families, the people who got on mobile, their society, the community, the families. If I don't do that now, try to establish that working and functional legal system, I will be a victim too. So I just have to do it now that I'm still strong. So that's why I came in to doing it here. So I, I don't know if you know, I lived in East Africa for about a decade in Nairobi. So the situation is the same that people retire up to their rural up country homes and the governmental support for older people is nearly non-existent unless they were a civil servant and they're receiving some kind of a pension. There's nothing at the sort of state level that ensures that people are getting financial support. There's nothing like senior centers, which is something that we have here in the United States, which are being modernized because we've learned that we don't actually need to separate our generations that actually we do better if we're not segregated and separated, but to provide additional Tailored support to the older people is not something I ever saw. And I think the assumption was that lifespans were not what they are today. And so people didn't live forever. Although I knew quite a number of hundred year old Kenyans. So that wasn't necessarily a true assumption. But what does that look like in Nigeria? Are you sort of agitating to get a state level support? Or is there something that already exists? Like I know South Africa has pensions for their elderly I'm not sure what's happening in Nigeria. Nigeria, only those that worked with the government have pension. Teachers work with the government. They are supposed to be paid pension. And then people who work with corporate organizations, you know, they do this contributory pension scheme. However, when they retire, they don't get this pension. I will tell you, most of my clients here, I know a couple of them that have died on the road because they will tell them, Okay, actually teachers, come to the state capital. You have to come with your ID card, your whatever, to come, 
show that you're still alive. It is you identify yourself. They go in there with the last money they have and they go through that ritual and they don't get anything back. A particular man had to trek a long distance. And then by the time he got close to my center, that was around 10 p.m. in the night. The vehicle did not know somebody was there. And then not him that he died. So you find this, even in my state, this state where I am now, nobody is even talking about the pensioners. They don't even look up to government for their pension anymore because they don't get paid. That is for those who worked. For those who didn't work, there's nothing for them. And we don't have safety net, nothing like safety net, nothing like old age pension. Even those that worked are not paid. How do you then talk about people who never worked? So that's why they have this tradition of they're using their children. They probably worked. They were farmers feeding the nation, probably. No, no. What I mean, never worked for the government. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Because they definitely worked, I'm sure. Those that work for the government, they don't pay them pension. How do you talk about people who didn't work for the government? That is why in Nigeria, they have this principle of putting your money into the training and education and whatever for your children. It's like insurance. So that when they start working, they give you back. But that also is not working because when they do it, they put in all their savings. Whatever they work, they plow it on their children. And then when the children come out of school, there are no good jobs. There are no jobs, actually. The unemployment rate is quite high in Nigeria now. Right now, they have 10 days protest. The youth are protesting. No jobs. Nothing to do. They are hungry. We don't have food. The older ones in the communities, because you have 70% of older persons in the community that are farming, don't even have any means of taking this food out because the cost of gas has gone up. So you take your food and then you want to transport it somewhere. The charge on it will consume the entire profit. So I would say those of us in the rural community, even we have more to eat, but they will want to sell to be able to buy some other things. And that's where the issue is. There's hunger. There's severe hunger in the country. So how did they get their money back that they plow like insurance? It's not there. So people are really suffering. So even in their old age, like when we have in my center, we have a day where we assemble every Thursday. We come together, we socialize. You will hear stories, heartbroken stories of how people are suffering. They will tell you how they have put in all their life savings and there's nothing. And in their old age, they can't even buy their routine medication. If I tell you the sacrifice we do in our center, we have a record. We just ask them, okay, we're, going, we're, we're not going to leave you to go like that. Especially those on routine medication, diabetes, hypertension, you know, with age. Age is a risk factor for some of these things, especially when they didn't practice healthy aging. So some of them will just go and they die. And we don't want to, we don't allow that. We say, okay, write down your name. We give you medication up to a particular amount. We say, you know what? Put in few things, some small money, and then you can get more. And that's what we are doing here to help them. Some of them at the end of the day, you know, these are old people. They get to a particular age, they pass away. And I don't get that money back. So that's the way we are maintaining. And again, we are doing some other things too. Like people on diabetic, diabetic food is quite expensive. So we try to look for food that will help them, cheaper food within the community that they can easily have access to. We found that there's a particular millet we find around here in Nigeria. And that millet, when they eat it, it brings down the sugar. I don't know how. But there's one professor of biochemistry in one of the university, University of Benin. He's helping us to do a research on it and see how we can also use it to do many more food and these people can eat. Recently, that particular food has gone up. It used to be very cheap because it's brought from the northern part of Nigeria. Transportation from there is gone up. We used to buy like 500 naira, a small half. But now it's 6,000. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. Tell me how did they buy. So those are some of the issues. 
So we are looking for other means to they can, you know, what else we can do. You know, Philomena, one of our hypotheses at the Grandmother Collective that we've been seeing is quite true, is that given experience, wisdom, and living on the planet longer than others, that our older women in our communities often have the solutions and answers for some of these challenges. So these are really big macro challenges, but I wonder if you have any examples of ways in which the older women that you work with are finding ways to help to alleviate or support in times that are kind of difficult in rural Nigeria. Beyond providing postpartum support, which is incredibly important and I'm sure provides purpose for them. But do you have any other examples of ways in which you've seen that older women can contribute? The work we do, we're yes. using older women to support older women. And not just older women. We use older women to support older persons, both male and female. So we created this network because we don't have volunteers. Able-bodied younger ones, we wanted to help us as well. They, they go about their business. They say they want to earn their own money. They want to make money. They can be doing free work. So these older women, we assemble them. They are older persons too, but they are stronger and healthier than others. And then we get their commitment that they are willing to commit some of their time to help take care of older persons in need. So they go around. We work with them because we don't have enough staff to go around all the communities. So these older women, we use them as focal points in their different small, small communities. So we go to them. They have an overview of what is happening in their old domain, in their quarters. So they tell us, okay, so, so, so it's happening. This person is not feeling fine. This person is lonely. So we gather all the information. So we're able to go and provide that service to that person. So they are helping us to do that. We have just one adult day center, and that cannot serve all the communities. How do they come to the center? They are, you know, it's far away. So we decided to engage the community leaders who are gatekeepers, actually, to their different community. In each community, you have homes where these people gather, no matter how small or as long as it's a hall. So we give us a day of that in a week. And then these older persons will help us to mobilize and gather the older persons, both male and female. They come in there to the hall and then we go there and take their vital signs, do, you know, everything we need to do, like activities, socialization. So these older women help us to mobilize, do all that. And then we follow up for those who need help. And then those that would need attention of the doctor, because we have one doctor that comes to, 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 to our center once a week. Then we'll call in, we do mobile telecommunication, we talk to the doctor, we do history. Or if the person needs to go to a bigger hospital, we help in getting the person there. So these older women help us. I know in lots of communities, the older women end up being community health workers. But there is also, I think, something that I've seen over time in the ways that older women mobilize and organize themselves, just like your August meeting that you're talking about, this idea that women gather and find each other and create really organically mutual support networks. And it sounds like you're kind of capitalizing on that. And that's something, they might be rotational savings schemes, what we call it in Kenya merry-go-rounds. I don't know what you call them in SUSAs, maybe SUSAs or, or things like that, where you you borrow money from each other or in your church gatherings and church groups, like women really lead when it comes to connecting each other. So they're a natural place for you to be getting that extra support. You got a lot of work ahead of you, Philomena. What are you hopeful for? What's making you feel hopeful today about the work that you're doing? I'm seeing lives change. I'm seeing communities accepting what we are doing and believing in what we are doing. And I would say deaths, even though I don't have research to show that, but we've seen cases where people come to the center, their blood pressure is so high, you'll be wondering why the person has not collapsed or fallen, you know. But we rally around and the person comes back to life. These things make me happy. It makes the work continue to go on. It encourages me. I'm seeing life changing. You know, like this Omogotin, people are imbibing it. 
and things are working. I was given uh, an award last year, December. They appreciate the community appreciating what I'm doing. It's not that it's the award. It is the mindset behind the award that they appreciate. So it keeps me going and it keeps me pushing. So I'm actually building a nursing home right now. By December, I should be done. I would say we don't do community work in Nigeria, but my center started community work. The School of Hygiene and Communities, where they produce these community workers, we have a platform now. And they are beginning to understand that they should, because this community, the students they produce, rather than come to the community to work, they go out to the hospitals in the town. They are not meant to be in the hospital. They are not nurses. They are community workers. So now I'm beginning to draw them back to the community. Come do your work in the community. These people need you. The community needs you. So it's quite difficult because you're starting an idea and it's quite difficult to really get people to imbibe it fully. So, but gradually, people are being, some rectors of some of the schools beginning to accept and uh, understand what I'm doing and appreciating it. So I'm happy about that too, because with time, we will get more community workers in the communities and they will start doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, it sounds to me like you're shifting mindsets. When I started this work, I came in with a lot of diapers. Nobody wanted to hear diaper. Even my mom that was living with me, the day I introduced it to her, she cried that I insulted her because she would mess herself. Then I introduced it. Nobody wanted to hear about it. But now people realize they need it. And it gives me, honestly, it makes me happy. Again, I'm not a medical doctor, but some of these women, our grandmothers, when they were young, most of them in the community are married very early, probably 15 years, 14, 16, they are married. And then they have so many children. And in those days, if you have, is it 12 children? They will have to kill a goat. They call it a wuku. They'll kill a goat for you. It's like an achievement. And it's well celebrated. So people endeavor to get it, that kind of achievement. So they have To get the goat killed for them. Exactly, the goat. You have 12 children. And then when you're old age, they start having issues. They are working. And you ask them, they say, arthritis. We've been able to manage some of these issues because they can't go for surgery. They don't have the money. We don't have doctors around. So what do they do? I'm just giving you examples. I'm not a doctor, but... You have to manage some of these things. People with dementia, who is going to diagnose that? But we just see them. We manage. We do counseling to the family, engage the people. Otherwise, I know a particular man that they would have killed in the community. They said he was the one causing all the problem they were experiencing in the family. And that God has caught up with him now. And that was why he was, they called it misbehavior. Meanwhile, I visited them. And I noticed he was like dementia. The guy had dementia because there was a day they subjected him to tell them where he put that he had a voodoo he buried in one of the rooms in the house. And they forced him to point at somewhere where he buried it. And, you know, somebody with dementia, he pointed at a point and they started digging it. And they dug and they couldn't find anything. They started beating him. So I had to call the family together and say, this man is sick. All he needed was care, love, attention. And then I kept talking to them and they changed their attitude towards him. The man is is gone now. But some of the things we see in the community, and when I see all this and people, like you said, mindset change, it makes me happy. You have put smile on the face of somebody. You have saved somebody who would have been killed. So I sleep and I'm happy. If you've never experienced or had the word to describe what's happening to your family member, then you rely on old mentalities. So you're helping people see a different reality, which is really, really incredible. I thought you would ask me how I survived all this because it's not easy in the community. Why don't you share your own self-care? How do you take care of yourself? Even though I teach self-care, it's quite difficult. What I do, I just take time off. I have a 
a small apartment in the city, in the capital, which is like 40 kilometers away from here. So when I notice my body is talking to me, I just go to the city. I force myself to go to the city. Even though I'm still on phone, but I'm out of the community. I have an um, opportunity to take long walks there because I can't do that in the community here because of kidnappers. So I can't do that kind of long walk here. So I go to the capital and I have opportunity to do that. Nobody knows me. So that's what. And in this evil community, you have women, the way women, there's this gender stereotyping gender discrimination. Even though I'm doing this much for the community, they still see me a woman. Like they would say, a woman that opens her leg to pee. That's the way I'm translating it in their, in their Igbo language. So if I'm going to see the community head, I have to go with a man. The man starts the introduction and then I continue the talk. So you can imagine, even when I'm doing outreach free, I have to go with a drink, which my husband will carry along and say, oh, we are doing free outreach, free medical mission. Please tell your community people to come around. And, you know, I join the women sometimes to, in their gathering, like, you know, you sit down and you put your leg, one leg on top of the other. You know what I mean? And I must cover my hair. I can't leave my hair open when I'm in a gathering. In a gathering of women? No, in a gathering where men and women sit together. Oh, okay, where it's mixed. It's mixed gender. Yeah, okay. Yes. And, you know, some of the work I do, they come, they say, oh, you have to go thank your husband so well for the work he's doing for you. My husband has no business in this work. But, <laughs> and then, if I'm with him and they see us, oh, they will congratulate him. Oh, we see the, your handwork. We see what you're doing. Even when I say, oh, it's me doing it. They say, no, it cannot be you. That your husband owns you. So I bought a property, land. I want to use for future hospital because I want to build an adult, a day hospital later in life. If I'm, I have the resources. And I wrote a check to pay for the land. They drafted an agreement. And in the agreement, I saw my husband's name. My name wasn't there. And I told them, I'm not giving you this check. You made a mistake. They should take out my husband's name and put my name there. They said they can never do it. They don't sell land to women. And I said, you don't sell land to women? He said, yes. Okay, but you want to collect money from a woman. It can't happen. So take your land. I'm, I would rather leave. And they wanted to sell this land. They wanted the money. And then they called my husband. And my husband was far away and said, your wife is refusing to give us the check because they had signed their own part. They wanted to give us the remaining so that my husband would sign and then return their own copy. And my husband said, why is she refusing to give you check? They said, because she said her name is not on the paper. So my husband asked them, who is giving you the check? They said, they don't know. And I told them, I said, the check is coming from my account. And so my husband told them, if the check is coming from her account, because I didn't give her any check, then put her name there. She's the one paying you, not me. They grudgingly changed it. Oh, my goodness. It's not illegal for women to own land in Nigeria. It was just these particular sellers didn't want to give it to a woman. It is not illegal. If I'm buying from the city, nobody is going to, I can buy. But it depends on the community. In this part of the country, in the rural community, you know, they are still traditional. That's why I said there's this gender stereotype here. Discrimination. Yeah. That is the condition under which I work. So when I'm doing things, I'm mindful of that. Otherwise, I'm going to have it hard. There's a property close to my center. I so much wanted it to expand my facility. I went to this guy who owns that property. He was going to sell it. I got so angry, so angry. She said, look at a woman, a woman that they married, wanting to buy land from me. He was so angry. I never sold that piece of land to me. Sold it to a man, to somebody else. If you hadn't been married, would he have sold it to you? It would have been worse. Okay. <laughs> if I had sent my husband, he would have sold it. 
But my husband wasn't around when I went. The man is somehow related to my husband somewhere, somehow. So I felt he will understand. He will appreciate the work I'm doing and send it to me and not mind. And if the need arises, he can always talk to my husband. That was my mindset when I went. But it turned out another way. It's unbelievable in 2024, considering how many female Nigerian leaders that we have in the world that are making great and incredible contributions, that those leaders have not trickled down to shift mindsets at the rural level is unbelievable. Things are changing. I will tell you one of those things that have changed. Before now, women come out to clean the road, weed everywhere, make sure the roads in the community, the roads are well weeded and all that. In my own community, where I come from, in Delta State, it's not so. Men do that job. I'm not from here. But in this community, women do it. So when we gather at women, you see, one good thing is that I'm also making influence. You know, I'm influencing some of their past opinion, their decisions. So when we had women meeting, I was there and I told them, look, this wedding, we are all getting old. You bend that, it's not that you're, you're wedding with, you know, cutlass and who, and you're sweeping, bending down. You have arthritis, you have waist pain, you are, you're old and you're doing this. And I told them, your children's wives will not come back to the community and join you to do this. You know, some of them, they are now learned and they have polished nails and you expect them to use those nails to come do this kind of work. I said, look, count it out. I will tell you that why don't we start contributing money? Engage men to do it. They say, huh? How come? And I've convinced them. And they agreed. I paid. I bought a large sum. And then we engaged one man. The man did it the first time. And said, you know, it's like other men are saying, so women engage you to come do this kind of work. But today, we are using this machine to clay it. So we bought uh, this wedding machine, you know, little one, you know, like the one you see abroad, you know, the one you, you carry, these long ones. That's what we're using now. These women are so happy now. They are not coming out again to uh, use their fingers, use the whole this to do. So we engaged one young man who does it. All we do is supply the, the gas and then pay him to do it. Things are changing. Uh, before now, you wear pants, long pants, they say, oh, you want to pollute and entice their men. Today, it's no longer so. I can wear pants now and walk around and go anywhere. Nobody is going to challenge me. But I can't wait to go to see the community head. No. But I can, at least I can wear, you know, when I'm doing my work, I can wear pants. So people are free and, you know, things are changing. For the past 10 years, I've been working around here. I'm seeing changes and I'm happy about it. It's not just me. I collaborate with other people to make this happen. And then when they come to our center too, you know, all these activity we normally have, we talk to them about it. And then, you know, tell them things that we learn. You need to, and then sometimes there are men are there. We tell the men, do you want your wife to suffer this way and all that? So we make the women empower those older women. The only problem I have, which I wanted to start with younger girls. I didn't register it at the national level, but I registered it at the local government level, the organization. I wanted to start training the children at that level because we realize that it is what they carry from that early age that they are bringing into old age. If we get them at the early age, by the time they get to old age, they would have been stabilized and well empowered. So that's what I realized. I can't handle everything. We hear that a lot. There's a woman in Indonesia that's teaching children about Alzheimer's and dementia because by doing that, it sort of normalizes it in the larger society. There's a group here in the U.S. that's really thinking about how do we destigmatize all of the really terrible stigmas we have about older people. And they've been framing it as elderhood begins at birth so that you actually spend a lifetime considering the role that you're going to play in your elderhood 
And we've lost it in many, many communities and cultures. This idea that we respect our elders, but we also in our elderhood have a responsibility back to the community, that it's part of the life course. So it sounds like you're kind of in that realm as well. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could talk for hours, I think. And we will continue to have more conversations with you as part of the Grandmother Collective. And Honestly, I'm so happy sharing this with you because I'm doing self-care to doing it because I'm able to bring out some of the things I you know, have in my heart, you know, sharing with you. It lightens me to lightens my mood. So I'm really grateful. Good. One of the things that we really know is that our grandmother change makers, people like you, there's a lot of loneliness in change making. So we know that change making is lonely. So one of the things that we really want to make sure we're doing is creating peer exchange and support networks. Even if you never collaborate with someone, the ability to share and connect on these issues. So Lamina, thank you so much for your change making, for obviously doing really incredible work in difficult situations. And we're just so happy to have you as part of our network. 